The fact that measured values of redshift do not vary continuously, but come in steps, is so unexpected that conventional astronomy has never been able to accept it, in spite of the overwhelming observational evidence. In their view, redshift measures radial component of velocities, and if galaxies can be pointed at any angle, then this should be evenly distributed. Yet, they are not. In fact, if we were to take the case that redshift was only caused by recessional velocity, then the fact that they come in measured equal steps in all directions would imply that we sit at the centre of a series of explosions. So once again, we must seriously consider that redshift is not caused by recessional velocity. Let's examine what ARP uncovered about the quantization of redshift. ARP spent a long time cataloguing redshift and determined that there appeared to be two periodicities, one at 72 km per second and one at 37.5 km per second. Let's examine the more recent observations of both and let's start with 72 km per second. If we examine our local group, we know that there are a number of smaller galaxies and hydrogen clouds that are distributed along the minor axis of M31 implying that the central galaxy in our local group is ejecting or has ejected material in this direction. Here we see the galaxies up to a redshift of 940 km per second which seem to belong to this line and are therefore younger members of the local group. We can easily see that these are not background galaxies in the diagram, as if they were you would expect this to increase sharply with fainter apparent magnitudes. More importantly is that this group shows a strong periodicity at 72 km per second. If we perform the same analysis on the sculpture group, which is the next nearest group between us and the M81 group, then here, once more, we see a very similar pattern, a clear periodicity at 72 km per second. Here we can see that even though the redshifts can reach up to 14 times this multiple, the average deviation from this period is only plus or minus 8 kilometers per second. If we pick the seven redshifts that are known with the greatest accuracy, this falls to 3 kilometers per second. ARP was not the only person interested in this quantization. Bruce Guthrie and William Napier, who were both at the Royal Observatories in Edinburgh, performed a rigorous statistical analysis on the galaxies with accurate redshifts in the direction of the Virgo cluster. They found the galaxies in the outer regions to be quantized in 72 km per second steps, but not in the inner part. They also discovered an even more pronounced periodicity at 37.5 km per second. A Fourier analysis of this clearly picks out this peak at 37.5. They published their results, and surprise, surprise, it was buried, ignored, and laughed at. In the 90s, some other respectable astronomers measured many galaxies in a small field and once more found a clumping of redshift. After some considerable delay, they nervously released their results. It clearly showed peaks at 0.3 and 0.6, and this was perfectly in line with what ARP had discovered for the redshift of some quasars. They attempted to suggest that the galaxies were spaced in intervals of 128 megaparsecs. In 1967, Jeffrey and Margaret Burbage had pointed out the existence of some redshifts in quasars which seemed to be preferred. In 1971, K.G. Carlson showed that these, and later observed redshifts, obeyed the mathematical formula 1 plus Z2 divided by 1 plus Z1 is equal to 1.23, where Z2 is the next highest redshift from the value Z1. This gives observed quasar redshift periodicity of z equals 0 0.061, 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.91, 1.41, 1 1.96. Sadly, no one in the mainstream took any notice of this. Yet, when we examine redshifts of quasars where more than one is associated with a low redshift galaxy, we see these numbers pop up. Three Chinese astronomers, HGB, Chu and his wife assisted ARP in conducting an analysis of the periodicity across all the data, 
they discovered that the predicted periodicity was a fit for this formula, with a confidence level of 94%. If they made the small correction for the parent galaxy redshift, this increased to 95%. If they removed one of the 14 discordant groups, this rose to a staggering 99.5%. One of the attempts to discredit the redshift periodicity is centred on the argument that quasars were discovered by their ultraviolet excess, and that the excess was caused by predominant emission lines moving into the ultraviolet window at certain redshifts, and hence that this selective effect was causing what appeared as periodicity. However, if one examines quasars which were discovered via their radio emissions, then the same pattern appears. Now this survey is split into two groups, one with a right ascension in the naught hour region and the other in the 12 hour region. Now these are the two principal regions in which the observations avoid the obscuring plane of our own galaxy in looking out into extragalactic sky. Now what is interesting is there is a 3% difference in the offset between these two groups. This more than likely represents a difference in redshift between quasars which are part of our local group versus those that are part of the local supercluster, Virgo. Together, these results represent a 99.7% confidence in the periodicity of the quasars. If we examine the entire catalogue of Z greater than 1.3 quasars in the 0-12 hour region, this periodicity disappears. This is often what is used to discredit the whole concept. But here it is important to understand that from the radio data, ARP showed that the relative distance produced an offset in the redshift. And when we examine the entire redshift catalogue, we are also including quasars that have a lower redshift, but are much fainter. If the redshift does not correspond to distance, then our best indication of distance is their apparent magnitude. So fainter quasars are probably much more distant, and it may well be that we are seeing a step change in the offset due to the distance, which will cause the picture to smear more and more with distance. The bright apparent magnitude high redshift quasars are mostly at the relatively close distance to our local group. We can see lower redshift quasars out to the distance of the local supercluster. If there is not much beyond the boundaries of the local supercluster, then we should see quasars of redshifts between 0.5 and 1 becoming relatively less numerous at fainter apparent magnitudes. Observations do indeed confirm this. In the 1940s and 50s, Willem Luton measured blue stars looking for the large proper motions which would identify nearby blue dwarf stars. Many years later, it would turn out that 40 of his stars were actually quasars. When we examine the redshift of these quasars, we once more find the same repeating pattern. As these are so bright, they are most likely some of the closest quasars to us. And this once more suggests that quasars at the peaks of 0.3 and 1.96 are generally the lowest luminosity and thus are seen in relatively greater numbers nearby. If we compare this to the earlier radio quasar graph, we can see that there, the highest peaks are at 0.6, 0.96, which would agree with the conclusion that they are the most luminous quasars that can be seen at greater distances. If we examine BLAC objects, which we have discussed in previous videos, once the redshifts are plotted, we once more see the same pattern of peaks at 0.3, 0.6 and 0.96. The peak at 0.6 is very important. When we examine the X-ray cluster, we see a sharp peak in their distribution at exactly this point as well. The clues to an injection process are in this data, and yes, some of this redshift does indeed come from velocity. If we take an example of a pair of quasars across from a Seyfert galaxy, on the left side we have a quasar at 0.65 and on the other we have one at 0.9. The first is 0.05 more than the 0.6 peak and on the other side it is 0.06 less than the 0.96 peak. This implies that one is moving towards us and one is moving away from us. Here is another example, M88, which has a number of quasars that surround it. We see one set of quasar pairs across this at Z equals 0.261 and 
We then also see another line from the quasar to the left with a redshift of 0.322. We have previously looked at the Abel cluster. If we examine this, then we see the Seyfert galaxy NGC 6212 at the centre. Now, does this show how the system would evolve over time? As the higher redshift reduces, we wind up with a populous cluster centred around this galaxy. The quasar clusters evolve into a cluster of galaxies. If we examine the redshift measure of Abel 85, which has a large number of galaxies in this X-ray cluster of galaxies, the first thing we notice is that it lists a redshift of 0.055, which is very close to our peak of 0.061. When we examine the distribution of redshifts, we see that they do indeed have discrete steps. Now, this is normally attributed to a large-scale structure in this direction. If, however, we look at this diagram, it clearly shows that the group of galaxies at higher redshifts are concentrated more to the centre of the cluster than the background galaxies. If the cluster of quasars evolved into clusters of galaxies, the crucial test of this process would be to see the quantization of quasar redshift be reflected in the quantization of galaxy redshifts. And this is exactly what we are seeing here. So where else do we find this quantization? When we look at the Bode law of planetary distances, then the value of 1.228, which ARP calculated from a combination of factors, provides a much better fit than the value of 1.72 7.5 used in the modified version of this law. Could it be coincidence that we find this in our planets? If quasars are birthed out of galaxies and they show this quantization, does a similar process happen with planets? Instead of them forming through an accretion process, does this start to show how this may in fact be another example of a birthing process? As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.